Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, so before getting started, uh, how many people here own a Raspberry Pi? OK. That many, uh, how many of you have already uh, write, written some programs to com control your Raspberry Pi? OK. How many used calling native? OK, that's very reassuring. Um, so today I'm going to talk about something kind of marginal and experimental, and which myself find a lot of uh, fun exploring. So my name is Qian, I'm uh, originally from China, and I work and live in Paris as an Android developer, and I'm also a GDE for IoT. So today, I will start by giving you some context about why I started to working with uh, such kind of a weird combination of technology, and how I uh, discover step by step how to make it work. So everything started last year. Um, I decided to build something uh, uh, to have fun. So I've been growing up as a lonely child always. So I'm always thinking about building a robot, an adversary to uh, play games with me. So what I was thinking was Android Things was a great platform at the time. And uh, it can allow me to have a lot of uh, uh, possibilities. So I started to um, uh, con con um, conceive this, this installation. So it ended up like this. You can play uh, rock, paper, scissor. So I had the ambition to add the lizard and the spark too, but they didn't work really well. And you can play with it, and it will uh, play with you at the same time. Then it has a, a camera which can recognize the gesture uh, the players played, and the user some machine learning. So it runs on TensorFlow Lite, and it can recognize uh, the gesture of the players. Then it can tell you, oh, you won or you lost. So it's um, um, a detailed view uh, as, as, uh, as you can see. Here's a small demo. C'est parti. So it's some game song. Press the button to start the game. Three, two, one, play. I lost game one. Rock brushes scissors dead face. So that's my uh, coworker, Michael. If uh, he's working the live streaming, he'd probably be surprised. Um, so the project was built by several tools. I built a data collection tool to uh, ask my friends and coworkers to upload photos for me. And I, I uh, for the hard part, uh, hardware part, I, I mainly used Android Things and other um, uh, server motors. And for the application which runs on Android Things, as you can see, I wrote them 100% uh, in Kotlin, and it runs on Android Things. That is the um, tools I used to ask people for uh, uploading photos. Then I stored them in, on Firebase. Then I ended up training them uh, on my own computer, and it's totally not legit if you want to use it in production. And for the hardware part, I used really uh, low budget because Android Things, I've already had it, and uh, the other uh, components you can find it easily on Amazon and at other places. So for who people, people who have, uh, haven't used Android things, um, it's an Android-based um, uh, embedded uh, platform. So developed by Google several years ago, and, um, and it's no longer um, up updating. Um, other than Android things, I've also used the uh, um, 16-channel um, driver to control different server motors. Um, during a weekend, I used my glue gun and some other uh, things I can find at my own place. And I ended up by doing this. So I was pretty happy uh, about the result. I was thinking, oh, I, I might be able to present it everywhere um, and have people uh, interested in the Android Things platform. Then two months later, um, Google decided to announce Android Things is no longer uh, in our roadmap. I was like, oh, that's very sad. And, but since I'm um, uh, an Android developer who writes Kotlin on a daily basis, I was thinking, why not um, discover another possibilities? So at the time, I've read an article written by Hardy in 2017, I think. And uh, that's maybe uh, one of the only, or two of the only articles on internet which uh, uses uh, calling Nate on, on Raspberry Pi. I was like, oh, maybe I can make it work. So um, at the time, I have no idea how calling Native works under the, 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 the cover. So I have to like try to understand it and uh, discover the uh, the how do we say the doability of my project. So I start by reading documentations. Um, the first sentence you will uh, run into when you read all the documentation of Kotlin Native is Kotlin Native is an LLVM backend um, for Kotlin compiler and it it's a native implementation uh, of the Kotlin runtime. 
the calling standard alert. It compiles calling code finally into the uh, binary, uh, native binaries, which can be run on different targets. Um, so to understand that paragraph, uh, not just literally, uh, but like uh, in a, a, a programmer's point of view, you have to have an idea of how compiler is designed. So a uh, compiler design, a classical one, um, contains uh, three phases. So there's always a front end, which compiles your code into some sort of uh, intermediate uh, representation. Then it often goes um, through um, a middle, uh, middle end, which often is an optimizer. Then it's, it passes through the back end to become finally the machine code. Um, as for LLVM, so I think a lot of people uh, in this room have already heard LLVM. LLVM is um, one of the most popular compiler infra infrastructure uh, nowadays. A lot of things are built on top of it, Rust, Swift, and a lot of awesome, uh, um, awesome uh, compilers. And it has uh, an implementation uh, slightly different as the um, architecture I've ju just showed you. So it actually uh, uses different levels of intermediate representation to, uh, to make it work. So how do we understand uh, calling native as a LLVM backend? So starting from the source code, we are uh, going through a transition um, coding compiler to obtain the, the first level of intermediate representation. Then uh, the coding native uh, compiler will do the job to convert it into an LLVM inter in intermediate uh, representation. Then uh, it com converts to the machine code. So that's how we obtain different um, native bin binaries for our different targets. Um, then I went on to read the documentation. So in the documentation, um, it basically tells you what's the target platform already existed for calling native. There are Android, iOS, Linux, macOS, Windows, WebAssembly. And as you saw this morning during the keynote, there's even a watch OS and TV OS now. What's interested me is the Linux part, because I know uh, Raspberry Pi is, um, is, uh, is uh, uh, runs uh, Raspbian, so Raspbian is a Debian-based uh, uh, OS. So I need to know if I'm doing this project, it can run some uh, Raspberry Pi. So uh, some of you have, might be familiar with what RM is, what uh, x86 um, is, but some of you might not be that familiar, so here I'm just uh, trying to uh, have a quick recap on what, what that is. So that's different kind of architectures. And uh, the majority of our uh, mobile platform and uh, Raspberry Pi uh, uses RM-based uh, chips. As for Raspberry Pi uh, 3, and we have uh, a typical RM V8 uh, chips. So at this point, I was, con I was convinced that it can work, and it's uh, already supported by Calling Native. I did another check on my Raspberry Pi, so it's uh, written RMHF, so it means hard float, and it's among the uh, supported target preset, which is Linux RM32 or H HFP. HFP means hard float port. At the beginning, I was scared by all this kind of uh, abbreviation, because it didn't ma doesn't make sense for people who haven't had the knowledge yet. Then I started to uh, look into the possibility of uh, cross-compilation, because you can always compile your uh, program directly on your Raspberry Pi, but since it's um, a little system and it's, it's just going to take forever to finish, so cross-compilation is a better solution uh, if I want to make the project work. So what's a cross-compilation? Uh, cross-compilation means uh, uh, compile your source code instead of on the target machine, but on a host machine uh, with the proper toolchain. In my case, I want to use my Mac, because that's the only PC I have. I have like an old PC, but like which runs on a weird version of uh, Ubuntu that I no longer use. So I want to see if this configuration uh, can work. And I keep on reading the documentation of Kotlin Native. Um, so I realized there's uh, two components to make the things work. The first one is uh, a Conan, uh, Conan C. Conan C means a calling native compiler. And the second one is a C entrop, means the, uh, the tools that helps you to um, create the calling binding uh, to have this uh, C interoperability. And it's actually simpler than a lot of people think. We always start by defining um, a, a define file. So it's ended up by a point uh, def. 
And we use this tool to generate the binding, and we use the binding to code, and then we compile everything with the compiler into the native uh, binary. And before going into the real code, I read another chapter of the calling native uh, documentation, which shows the different mapping of uh, C types uh, uh, towards uh, Kotlin types. So I was like, at this point, I should be probably ready to start coding this thing. Then I realized also IntelliJ is putting it. I was like, oh, everything's aligned, and uh, all the wonders start by uh, laying the first brick. So I should get started. Um, I start to set up everything, uh, find my uh, Raspberry Pi, plug some uh, um, wires. So that's the uh, first uh, setup looks like. I have a LED, and I have a button, and I have a resistor just to make nothing like a, a burns at the, at the installation. Uh, for people who haven't uh, programmed with a, a Raspberry Pi, so there's a thing called a GPIO, so it's a general purpose input and output. On the Raspberry Pi, you just saw there's uh, two lines of pings. So um, today I'm going to uh, explore several pings uh, in my presentation, not all of them. Um, so I'm uh, marking everything out. Uh, VCC means uh, the where you should get your power, ground means the, where you should uh, plug your ground and everything. I think it's like basic electronics and everybody should know it. Um, I started uh, in Gen uh, February 2019 this year, so I was trying to make it work with the only two or three articles that I find on the internet, which is very difficult because comparing to other technology, you have like thousands of Stack Overflow posts and everything. It's pretty marginal and uh, I run into some difficulties right away. So a uh, compiler told me the target's not available on your host. So basically means you can't do the cross compilation on the MacBook for, your, uh, for, the, for the Raspberry Pi. So that was the first uh, hit of frustration. And then two months later in April, I started to like, uh, check the news and I realized, oh, now it works. Because in the 1.3.30, they actually uh, re released the support for that. So that was a moment of relief because I had a conference coming up and everything. Um, so the first step was to make a, a typical hello world works. I start writing my first main function, uh, a calling native, which will uh, later on run on Raspberry Pi. And I was thinking, uh, what's a better way to understand how things work by compiling everything manually? So I used the calling compiler, calling native compiler, and it's actually very simple. You just have to say, oh, my output, the name of my output, and the target name of my uh, target uh, platform. It generates uh, um, a, an executable, which ends with uh, point k exe. Uh, exe and the, to make it work on Raspberry Pi, you just have to uh, copy it. So I'm doing a simple SCP. And it works. That was uh, the very first uh, Kotlin native um, application I run on my Raspberry Pi. So I was like, OK, that works. Let's uh, push the things a little bit further. So I should make the basic GPIO works. So let's start by using uh, make the LED uh, flickering. Um, before uh, before uh, um, doing this project, I, I'm, I've been using Android things or other Python libraries. So what's uh, the advantage of using those kind of uh, library is like everything's already wrapped. All the drivers has already been provided and you have nothing to worry about. You just have to call the high level API functions. But this time I'm getting uh, a, deep, a deep dive uh, to the low level, and I have to do it myself uh, through some um, um, interoperability. And so I started to uh, look for the library I can use to make this work. As, you ca as, as some of you may know, uh, the, one of the most famous library which works with uh, a Raspberry Pi GPIO is PyGPIO. So it has been used in a lot of uh, Python or other language bindings. So it's uh, uh, the layer below. There is another uh, library called WiringP. So those two are the two uh, C libraries which are most frequently used by the community. 
Um, so I choose the PyPy GPIO because there are some most, a lot of uh, uh, discussions on how to use uh, the, the library and the documentation on C uh, library is very, uh, very detailed and very well. I start by create my first uh, PyGPIO dev file. So inside this file, I just have to say uh, what's the header file. Then I use the C enter, pro, uh, enter rope tool to generate my Kotlin binding, then run the Kotlin native compiler. So how does that work uh, step by step? That's how my uh, definition file looks like. You just have to say, oh, this is my header file. Then you go on to generate your Kotlin binding. It looks uh, like a, a complicated command, but if you break line by line, you can see this is my definition file. This is the compiler option which indicates where is the header file. Then it's the name of my output, and this is the name of my target. So when you finish doing all this, it will generate two, uh, two things uh, majorly. The first one is a Kotlin binding. So it ends up with a Klib. The other one is the uh, build folder with a lot of other stuff. So at this point, I have a Kotlin binding which works with the PyGPIO C library. I have to make it uh, at my purpose. So I start to like looking to the basic APIs. What should I do to initialize the GPIOs? What I should do to, to um, give them values or read their values or make them sleep for a certain um, amount of time? As you can see, this is a C um, API. It's very simple, actually. You just have to pass the right uh, ping name. Uh, you have to pass the right value, and it does the job. And let's have a look at the Kotlin, bind, Kotlin native binding. So the Kotlin, Kotlin binding looks a little bit more complicated. And you can see there are um, a types, mappings, uh, happens. So it turns out to blink your LED is not that hard with Kotlin native. Uh, thanks to the article of uh, Hadi uh, in 2017, I made it work like in less maybe than two hours. Um, that's very important, so it kind of encourages me to keep going. Um, I was saying, okay, um, but I have the, the program which, uh, which uh, sort of uh, uh, compiles, there's no error, but how do I build the binary that works on Raspberry Pi? So at this moment, the things become a little bit trickier. So to make the library, to make the final binary works on Raspberry Pi, you have to have the right library. So the library should come from Raspberry Pi. So what, what's happening is like I'm uh, building the Pi uh, GPIO library on my Raspberry Pi to generate the, the shared object. So it's the, the library here you can see. And I retrieved it for the cross compilation on my MacBook. I lost nobody. Everybody's still with me. OK, and um, so. That's, the magic, that's where the magic happened. I used the, com uh, the compiler to compile my binary by indicating what is the library I'm going to use. This is the Kotlin binding I just generated. And this is the library I link, because if you link the wrong library, your binary, uh, your binary won't work on the target machine. And this is the name of my output, and uh, we are still targeting Raspberry Pi. And this generates uh, a LED uh, executable, which actually blinks the LED. Everything till this moment was pretty smooth. I, I get the idea uh, what's a step like to make things work. I'm saying, okay, I'm doing a lot of things manually. Let's move uh, the project into uh, IntelliJ. It's more modern and there's a plugin which uh, supports everything. So the Kotlin uh, multi-platform plugin not only supports uh, all the uh, cross-platform mobile apps and other stuff, it also, uh, it also supports this kind of uh, uh, weird project. Um, but the thing is, it's still very experimental and the DSL changes very often. So you have to um, uh, look up all the samples in the uh, repository to have a better idea about the APIs. Um, the initial configuration is kind of very painful, so I spend a lot of time just to make things work as it is. Uh, as you can see here, uh, we can see the uh, name of the target, we can see how the binary is generated by link the right library, and we can see how the um, interrope tools uh, is used to generate the binding. So actually, all the manual uh, steps that I just showed was contained um, in this uh, small piece of um, 
um, uh, Groovy. And then I started to like do a lot of SCP, so like repetitive um, uh, tasks. So I was thinking, okay, let's auto, auto, automate everything. Um, it's very simple because if you are using IntelliJ and Gradle, there are plugins which does the SSH for you. So I ended up writing a small uh, tasks just to deploy everything on P. So what I ha what I have to do every time I, I change my code, I just have to do a Gradle uh, build and deploy on Py. So that's kind of streamlined the whole process of uh, building this prototype. And I decided to push the things a little bit further. Now I can make the light blink. And how do I uh, intercept the action of uh, pushing on my buttons? So this time we're using another uh, GPIO, which is slightly different because the LED is an output pin, and this time we need another pin to as an input. I was thinking, so once I launch my uh, binary, it actually uh, uh, goes into a continuous loop. So the only way I can actually interact, interact with it, it's by a physical input. So I have to have a callback for my, for my uh, button push. Um, so I go back to see, read the uh, document, uh, documentation on Py, uh, GPIO. There is a method called um, set alert function. As you can see, it takes the name of the uh, pin, then it takes a C function. Um, so far, so good. Until I see the calling binding of this method, I was seeing C pointer, C function, and other stuff. That's the moment I start to panic a little bit. I was like, oh, what's that? And how do we that make that work? I kind of uh, find the equivalent between the type def and type alias, as you, as you might remember from one of the previous slides. So everything is mapped to calling uh, kind of perfectly. But the thing is, how, uh, how do we uh, map a function pointer um, from C in Kotlin? Um, Actually, uh, JetBrain has already uh, uh, prepared there, prepared that thing. So there is um, a, a nice wrapper called static C function, which allows you to kind of convert a calling function seamlessly to a C function. My code ends up look like this. So you um, just uh, declare your lambda or whatever, and you pass it with the static C function. And it works just really well, except there are problem of uh, sampling rates. If you are a hardware fan, you know the sampling rate is very tricky and it can, it can vary uh, depending on your hardware component. You have to calibrate it uh, carefully, otherwise it can have the interference and everything. Um, so my callback works pretty well, uh, except it can like, have a multiple uh, action fired at the same time, which I still try to figure out why. So till now, uh, my LED works, my button works. Uh, I want to do some uh, more control over my Raspberry Pi. So I was like, okay, we can try to control the server motor. So the server motor, um, it's a little bit more complicated because before using server motor, we have to uh, understand what is uh, the uh, I2C protocol. Since everybody here, almost like everybody have a Raspberry Pi, I suppose you have already uh, programmed something with I2C. So it's a protocol which allows a master to control uh, different slavers uh, through the synchronization of clocks. And there are um, two concepts to, to, to remember. It's SCL and SDA. And, and they are the pings that we can find on all the GPIO pings. So this time, we're going to use those two pings to uh, synchronize with the driver and also to uh, give them data. So my uh, installation becomes a little bit complicated. You can see the camera is plugged on too because I was doing something with the camera too. And to control this servo motor, you also have to understand what is a, a PWM, pulse width modulation. So pulse width modulation is a methodology to um, apply some uh, proportional control on your electronic signals. So um, instead of uh, uh, having something really uh, uh, one shot, you can have a finer control over what happens with your hardware component. It's, um, it's been uh, widely used for several motors and uh, also um, LEDs and LCD displays. If I take a typical server motor SG90 as an example, um, there are different uh, duty cycles. Duty cycle means uh, when the, when the uh, uh, signal is high. 
So um, uh, SG90, normally it has a degree between zero degree and 180 degree. So if you apply a pulse width for just in between, you can have the, the uh, server motor just um, wave half of the angles. So that's the basic knowledge I had to have, uh, to have uh, before going into that. And our drive, it has uh, um, a master chip called PCA9685. Uh, so that's an important name to remember because when you start to looking for C libraries or low level uh, libraries, they are normally named with those name of the uh, master chip. I found a C++ library really quickly, but the thing is it's not working with Kotlin native. There's a huge post on the Kotlin forum uh, about the discussion um, on whether should uh, C++ be, uh, be supported by Kotlin Native. I ended up uh, finding a small but really essential uh, libraries. So the same steps. I uh, stalled, installed this uh, library on my Raspberry Pi. I built the library. I obtained the, the, the lib, the shared object. Then I, I got it back for cross compilation. And this time, the APIs, the, the API become a little bit uh, different. So this one is for initialization. It's still very simple. You just have to give it to the right E2C address and uh, everything works as it should. But the things become a little bit more complicated when you wanted to control your server motors by uh, giving them angle values. Um, there are several methods that we can use for the angle values. Um, I'm pretty interested by the first one. So the first one actually asks for um, a pointer of a, of an array. So that's the thing uh, start to bother me. So how do we pass a, a pointer of array uh, into in, the, in Kotlin native? I start to read the code in Kotlin binding. So the Kotlin binding, you can see something called C values references. That's something I've never seen in my life, and I just uh, naturally panic again. Um, when I go to the API doc of Kotlin Native, you can see the C values reference is actually um, a ref, um, represents a reference sequence of a C value. Um, it's actually designed so that a developer, when they use Kotlin Native, um, they don't have to do the memory allocation uh, manually. At the beginning, I don't know that. So I was like, oh, this looks complicated, let's do it native way. And in Kotlin Native, there is something called MemScope. So MemScope is um, giving you the possibility of having a native placement. Then inside this block, you can do everything a native way. You can initialize your array with the right size and uh, giving them the right value. So my first solution looked like this. And it's just almost the C way, but written in Kotlin. Then I find out, actually, Kotlin Native has provided other simpler solutions. Um, they, pro uh, they provided the uh, extensions, for example, to C values, which allows us to, uh, to create this self-contained immutable, actually, sequence of C values. It can be passed around between uh, calling um, binding and C level really uh, smoothly. So my second implementation looks way uh, much more uh, Kotlin here. Um, all the points. All the way through here, uh, half hours has already passed. I hope everybody's still um, with me. I started to, to try to uh, capture images with my camera, which is plugged on my Raspberry Pi. So at this point, um, I kind of just have no idea what should I do, because I know the, all the Raspberry Pi camera applications, they run on something really complicated. And I, there's no way I can find a simple uh, C API that I wanted to, 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 to do the things I want. So I cheated. I used uh, the binding of for the very low level and I basically um, run a command line from my program. But that works. And uh, as long as it's the last thing you do before exiting, because it's just going to throw you all the way back to your, your loop. And after all this, I was like, okay, maybe I should try to make TensorFlow work, but it seems so impossible because, you know, just too far away. Like, how, how do I make them work together? So I started to look at, um, is there something in C already for test TensorFlow? So I'd, actually, there is a C library for TensorFlow, uh, which is supported, like, on different platforms, but, like, in the list, there is no Raspberry Pi. 
there is nothing near that thing. So I was like, stay calm and we can try to build uh, everything ourselves. So I started to like a, a long journey of uh, trying to build TensorFlow from scratch, from source, we're using Bezel, uh, so endless nights um, at like maybe 10 or 20 times of failure, I, I was saying, okay, no longer trying to make that happen. Then I find a Japanese engineer who put all the binaries he built with success on GitHub. So I was like, that's amazing. And thank you, uh, internet. So I write a thank you tweet uh, to him on Twitter. Um, that actually allows me to make things work, but like I didn't push all the way to do the image uh, infer uh, inferencing because it, it was becoming more painful than fun. I can load a graph, I can create a basic tensor which does the calculation because there is a TensorFlow example in Kotlin native library, uh, uh, GitHub. But doing image recognition all the way, that requires a lot of knowledge on TensorFlow. Uh, on TensorFlow C API, which is not documented, on Kotlin native, on C and everything. I was like, okay, I'll stop, he stop here. And now uh, I can show you some demos with everything I succeeded in doing. So there's a circular uh, uh, diagram. So everything I've plugged together and I did some upgrade with Lego. It definitely helped with my mental health. And this is the demo. <laughs> that thing I took it took a long time to 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 work. Then I did some like a TensorFlow basic operations. Then there's uh, the cheat, the, the the camera thing. That's it. So that 30 seconds demo took me I don't know how long to, to finish, but, uh, but that was cool. So time to conclude this very uh, ridiculous and funny journey of uh, calling native on Raspberry Pi. What I've learned from the whole experimentation and uh, playing around, so this is very experimental. Don't try it at your place because it's kind of dangerous because um, you risk to just to start to being nostalgic about like why I'm doing this. I should use other things, which is more mature. And this, what I use in TensorFlow for C interoperability, it's just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of other things you can use which requires like more extensive uh, C knowledge, which I don't have uh, actually. And the debugging is really hard. So there's actually no debugging tool for calling native on this kind of purpose. And what I was doing just to like print lines, print lines, print lines. I think that's very effective. And uh, also since I'm interacting with a low level a library directly, I have problem with the sample rating and I don't really necessarily know how to fine tuning that. So that's made me a kind of uh, um, uh, uh, crazy for a while, um, but I learned a lot from exploring this because I learned a lot of things about the compiler again because in school we tried to build our compilers, but that was painful because you don't understand why are we doing this. Now I wanted to write a LLVM backend myself just to understand how everything works, which is pretty amazing. And it was fun exploring. And why I'm doing this, because software is getting uh, incredibly complex these days and interfacing between different languages is becoming super important. That's why we're seeing so many different talks on uh, multi-platform um, applications to, uh, to capitalize our uh, business logic at, at maximum rate. So I think that's a very good way to start to, to try to mutualize our works. And also, uh, by doing this, I have actually have a low-level control without uh, giving up my high-level high uh, convenience. As you can see, we keep working, uh, keep writing in Kotlin uh, for those kind of um, uh, applications. And uh, the openness of Kotlin native, it's just amazing. And uh, maybe some days we will have plugins for WebAssembly written in Kotlin native that will like just tremendous um, boost the, um, the efficiency. And our, I also saw some um, discussions on, on the internet about uh, a comparison between Kotlin native and Rust. So um, if you have already played with Rust, you know uh, Rust also it used LLVM as a backend, but it's very different in terms of uh, memory management model. 
because Kotlin, uh, it's uh, for Kotlin, it's automated. We have a reference counter and a cycle uh, collector, but for Rust, it's a smart pointer. So everything uh, the memory uh, in terms of memory is managed uh, manually, which gives uh, a, a pro programmer a uh, better control over memory. But like, uh, it's you have to be there, do the memory thing pointer and stuff. Um, and also, Rust exists uh, longer uh, uh, comparing to Kotlin native, so it has a mature level which is uh, higher. But it stayed kind of in a very tight scope uh, and um, endured by a lot of people who love uh, high performance uh, program which have the memory uh, management to the point. And uh, I think in the near future, we'll have more news on those kind of uh, application. Um, this stays as an experiment, but like you, it shows uh, all the possibilities in the future that we may have. And uh, I thank all these people who did the talks and uh, wrote articles on internet. Without them, I can't make that work. And if you want to uh, check out the code, um, I put it on the GitHub so you can take a photo and uh, and try to play it with it. It's called Shifumi because in French, like rock, paper, scissors is called Shifumi and I don't know why. Um, thank you, and uh, don't forget to vote, and I'll come back to the slide. If you have any questions, I think we still have uh, several minutes.